The Morning Brew Podcast with Jaffe and Razor, sponsored by Berkshire Bank Home Lending. Where you borrow matters. Well, this is the beauty of professional sports, sports in general. Sometimes you just never know. You might think you know, but then you don't know. Because heading into the game on Monday afternoon at TD Garden, who would have expected? Don't tell me you expected the Bruins, not you personally, Razor, to win 5-1. to one. But what Bruin fan out there thought that it would be as thorough a game, arguably their most c- consistent 60-minute full effort this season against the best team, definitely in the West, maybe in the NHL, the Colorado Avalanche. And the Bruins skate to a almost dominant 5-1 victory. I'm not going to say they crushed them, but they methodically took care of the game as we welcome you in to Morning Brew with Jaffe and Razor, presented by Berkshire Bank. Um, Razor, it was fun. It was, it was, I mean, it was a it was. great buzz in the crowd. It was a gorgeous, I'm not going to call spring day, but mid winter, late winter day in, in Boston. Sun was out. Fun day at TD Garden, buddy. It was a blast. Great product, pat, fast paced hockey game. Both sides were moving up and down the ice and, and the Bruins, like you said, they they showed up for for all sixty. Played exactly their uh, what we what we think is their identity. They played to it. Uh, not sure if they have that identity, but what we think of them and what we've seen of them the last few years was exactly what we saw today. And it was fun. It was just good to see that. Um, and 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 you you just kind of brought it up, and I, I was thinking about it. You, maybe the maybe the East really is much much better than the West, and maybe. and I'm not taking just this one game, but um, it, it is interesting to think about how dominant Carolina was against the Bruins twice in this building, mm-hmm. and how different that is from what the Colorado Avalanche are, and you you, you back into that a little bit, but but. Beyond that, uh, all of a sudden, you know, it gives you a little, it gives you a good feeling about this team a little bit more than what we've had the last four, five, six, seven days. And then to go three, two, and one without Brad Marshawn and go out on the road, which is going to be a tough road trip. Oh yeah, my I, God. It's, 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 it's a big one. This is the big one. So they go three, two, and one without Brad. Well, let's not forget, what was it two games without Patrice? Two? Two? Am I forgetting <laughs> with three? <laughs> two, um, yeah. Two. So. You know, you know, we get caught up in the, you know, we know all the warts, so to speak, of this team, right? And we get caught up. Yes. In it. Yep. I am not ready to raise the, the, the. Uh, they're going to win it all, flag right now. But what I am going to say, is you know, they're, um, they showed something. I still, I still, am disappointed with the result with on the island, if only because, and we said this in post game on Nesson. I thought it was a really good show today, by the way, on Nessa. I did. I, I just thought it was really good from start to finish. I'm not patting us on the back. Maybe I am a little. But I'm saying I thought it was a good show. Holy shit, we covered a lot. So, anyways, getting back. Yeah. Um, it's the hour know, before, and we get to we don't have to cram stuff in, too. Yeah, you know, exactly. We also have a good good product, too, right? <laughs> like, That's true. Yeah. For us. If it was 5-1 the plus. other way, it would have been, it would have been, a, it would have been a shit show. Yeah. We, that's right. But. I said in the post game, we said that I still am disappointed with that Islander game because think about it, you end up four two and one or, or four and two basically, or whatever it ends up. I, I, I'm awful at math. You know, you have four wins, four, four one, one and one, four one, four, and one. one and one. Yeah, even even better, nine points. Right, right. So like you had it, that, and that's what I guess keeps me so cautious about this team of of you know falling in lust with them, if only because. I think we see them so much. We know everything that they're about. 
But yet today, today, Monday afternoon, TD Garden, something special. Good time. We haven't done this in a little while with, with Brew. Let's kind of run through the game. Quick comments on yeah. it. Um, the Bruins get going in the first period with tremendous forechecking. We understand. We've talked about it numerous times. Forecheck doesn't start without good puck movement out through the zone, through the neutral zone. However, they made really good decisions and effort in the ozone. And I thought they won numerous battles along the wall. I thought they took pucks off the wall and moved it to good areas very quickly. And they didn't allow, you know, they didn't give up on plays. They didn't allow Colorado to beat them almost anywhere in the first period. And because of that, they get a goal at the uh, 1730 mark, uh, what was huge. But they also outshot them 21 to 9 in the first period. I love their wall play. What did you love about the first period? Well, it's funny because we had our kids at the game. My kids were running around. My every, one of my kids got there a little late, so I was watching the game. But I was all like, I, 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 I was watching, but I hadn't looked at the shot clock. And at one point, I said, is it really fifteen to three? Mm-hmm. Like it was so ten minutes in when I something. turned to you. I, are these yeah. shot clocks right? Like, is this right? I don't. I, I see that they're playing well, but is it really fifteen to three? And and it and it was. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was. It, it was really impressive how, again, they were – what what stood out to me in that first period was just their ability to sustain it for 20 minutes against that team. And and you assume that, like, at some point when you're on a team, a good team like Colorado, and they look up the shot clock after the second commercial break and it's 15-3, to three, somebody – they don't wait till the end of the period to get get on that. They, they, mm-hmm. they push back, and they couldn't. The Bruins didn't allow them to do that, and – so, so that that really stood out to me is is just how, to your point, methodical it was, how low key dominance it was all the way through that period. They took it to the defense, which is pretty good for Colorado. I wonder after watching you know, the defense, you know, it's hard not to love McCart. It's hard not to like Devon Taves. I, I I don't think either of them had a great game, especially McCart. I thought he struggled. Um, at times, yeah. and that's going to happen. It, so, so this is let's. I want to get to because if we don't, I'll, and it's really, really, extremely unfair and extremely uh, short sighted. But does Victor Hedman cause more problems than Kale McCarr? Would you rather have Victor Hedman than Kale McCarr for this exact game? That if Kale McCarr doesn't walk the line, if he doesn't have nine wristers on net, is he? Can he change the game the same way Victor Hedman can? Well, Hedman and his defensive prowess and his six six, I don't know what is he two thirty? I don't know. Yeah, this uh, takes up a ton of ice. He closes. He's like a the, you know this gargantuan behemoth out there that can also oh by the way skate by you too um i think that overall i'm splitting hairs and as we always know i don't have a lot of hairs left to split but i think overall headman is the better overall defenseman yeah kel mccarr is revolutionizing how how he is played yes i i agree i just i i i watch that tonight McCarr, and it's just you know he's he's great don't get me wrong i just he, there's an it, there's a there's an eye test that that the imposiveness of a of a zidane ochara prime and a victor hedman prime is something that you can't replicate with good edge work on the blue line yeah fair um I, i'm wondering if could victor hedman almost be the end, it, could he be kind of like the last of his style where a guy that can put up good points, but he plays it differently. I mean, we're seeing more guys like an Adam Fox, like a Charlie McAvoy, like a Kale McCarr. We're seeing that type of defenseman become the new era defenseman, whereas a Roman Yossi, he's pretty damn good too, by the way, really good. But in a, in a, in a Victor Hedman, they're not old, but they're definitely not, you know, I feel like, you know, like I say, I say all the time, Kale McCart is the old triple Lindy, you know, the Rodney Dangerfield type of thing out on the ice, you know, like he dances, he shucks and jives, he does this, he does that. And you're like, how the hell does he do it? Hedman beats you with grace, reads, anticipation, and then brute power. 
He is that freight mm-hmm. train. It's like an, a like a like the ultimate supercharged freight train, right? That's what he is. So it's just different. It's yeah. interesting. I mean, Hedman will always get my vote. Always. Yep. No, uh, me too. McCars. He struggled I, a bit this I, game. It, sorry to sidetrack us. We're, we're going to stick with the game. I, I just needed to get that in because okay. it, it it it's it's. I just I mean, notice it when this guy in these games like this, when you when you don't notice a smaller, effective shooting offensive defenseman, I think about how do you make a Stanley – how do you win a Stanley Cup with that defense, the Colorado Avalanche have? Well, they're hoping that Eric Johnson – and I really don't want to go too tangent here, but him being back no, in no, the lineup. Right. Remember, he had been hurt, and he came back, yeah. and he's played a better role for them. By the way, um, I, it is a tangent, but I think it's relevant to the Bruins. Yep. You, we could tie this all the way back to the Bruins and, and their back end because it's very similar to Colorado's, actually. It, it, it's much more similar to Colorado's back end than it is to Tampa Bay's. Excellent point. Excellent. Yes, you're right. Stylistically, at least. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, yeah, Eric Johnson, he's more physical than a guy like Carlo. They're two big right shot defense and pretty much the same size. But Johnson will play more physical. But you could argue that Carlo actually, when he's on, is a better skater than Eric Johnson. That's right. And you could argue that McAvoy is like McCarr, but plays more physical. So, so those guys even out the, right. you know, what are supposed to be your yeah. two better. No, that's a, yeah. And, and, and Devin Taves or Devon Taves, he's, uh, he's kind of helped separate Colorado from some other teams. He added that left shot. They already had the Samuel Gerard kid who's having a really good year, but yeah. he's doing it because he's seeing different type of pressure than he used to with, you know, without Kale McCarr there. Now that he's here, but Taves, I think, is the one that's mm-hmm. kind of put them into a d- better spot. But now you're talking uh, McDermott as your number six. Um, they have the other kid, Ryan Murray. He didn't play uh, in this game. Yeah, so he'd be like, uh, would a would a would a Ryan Murray be a a Mike Riley or a Connor Clifton, or would that mm-hmm. be like a Jack Johnson, yeah. be like a Connor Clifton? So it's interesting. It's a good. Yeah. It's a good. It's a it's a worthy chat on a podcast tangent put it that way so yeah there we go but we tie i tied it in i, I took you off of it because i know you have it dialed in but I, I i did bring it back for you a little bit okay well i appreciate that so the end of the first period's yeah, one nothing after posternock pops in the goal coming off the bench after a great shift by the coil line led by trent frederick then coil working the puck etc eventually the bruins get a full change puck is zipped towards the front of the net um from uh, McAvoy, he's trying to hit Patrice Bergeron. Fortuitous bounce, really, Razor. I mean, just couldn't have – I think it went off the maybe the defender skate in front, too, and it went popped right to Pasternak, weak side. He makes it one nothing. Bruins feel pretty good. They feel really good, though, eight minutes into the second period. And we showed again on Nesson, they kept forechecking. Important. Important. They never allowed Colorado to begin the second. And we all know lately since – what is the last six games or so where their first periods have been great and the second and third have been shit for the Bruins. Mm. Bergeron gets his goal, and he hadn't scored regularly in a while. 13th goal of the season. Hall with a really nice patient play eventually gets it to Patrice Bergeron, who, who's in the mid-left side of the slot, gets one shot off that was pretty good. Not a zipper, but pretty good. But the puck came right back to him off another fortunate bounce off the pad of Kemper. And then he was able to... Almost a, a slice shot it in past the glove side of, of Darcy Kemper. But that goal obviously was extending the lead huge for this team. Yeah. yeah the longer that game was one nothing, the 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 worse you felt as a Bruins fan, the way they were just smoking them in shot. 26 to 10 at that point. It was just they because they came out in the second, they 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 held to it. Mm-hmm. They they were still bringing it. And, and you just felt like, oh boy, this is this this says. This could be trouble here. Um, the longer this stays, one nothing. Got the second one, and again, it was from it was the same blueprint as the first goal with and and, and basically all night. So that that's the real positive too is they weren't getting freebies from this team. They didn't get any freebies. All these goals were were really solid goals. Yes, D- diligent, diligent effort. Mm-hmm. So it's two nothing. Five minutes later. On the power play, Colorado gets a goal from Nathan McKinnon. Before that, though, so it's 2 nothing at that time. And I'm going to tie it back. No, I'm going to go to the Taylor Hall hit on Nathan McKinnon back in uh, uh, January. Um, 
Were you surprised then that nobody really, I mean, nobody pulled anybody, so to speak, into the fight by Colorado at that point? Did I mean, we weren't sure. We talked pregame. Would there be anything? We both said, we said both coaches said that they moved past it, but the players really decide that more than anything. Um, I, I mean, I, it wasn't like Colorado, again, was dominating, saying we're going to be fine. Did you, did you, I thought at that point, maybe that's when somebody, a Landis Gog, would just grab somebody and try and get his team going. And at one point, of late, much later in the game, he tried to do it with McAvoy again, you know, after a bit. But, but I thought down to nothing, they may have done that. Yeah, it would have made sense to try and get some energy. I, I, the Leafs changed a little bit. It's hard to do that. But it, it has restored, it, it did restore because we, there's been some complaints about, you know, scrums or fights after an, a, a real hit, an open ice hit that's uh-huh. clean and, you know, get that. But it, it, that the today restored my faith in the guys in the league because the whole Hall McKinnon thing did not deserve retribution. It was a, a freak right. play. The stick came up and it seemed for me now I can say, all right, these guys recognize that they're not running around trying to get after a, a Former MVP in the league, by the way, that is, deserves a little bit of respect too, Taylor Hall, in not being dirty. He wasn't being dirty, um, mm-hmm. and and it seemed as though the Avalanche recognized that. So, so they just had no pushback. The Avs had no pushback, and whether it, a, a lot of that, you can give credit to the Bruins. You have to take some credit away from the Avalanche. They they didn't really want to play today. If if you want to back into it all the way there, that it didn't seem as though they were too excited to have to play a hockey game this afternoon. No, and and I'm sure that they had a good time in the seaport or wherever they were on Saturday night. Mm-hmm. But they had and Sunday whoever off. overserved they, them as much as they did Saturday. Somebody, yeah, well done. Some, uh, but they practiced Sunday. They had they had the sweat, the guilt sweat, so to speak. Get that out. Not even guilty mm-hmm. anymore, right? I mean, just you get out. But you're yeah. right. They didn't have they they didn't have that push. Now they did get a goal by McKinnon on the power play, a real hard sh- wrister snapshot uh, at uh, thirteen minutes twelve fifty eight. Right, he gets a, a clapper, just a, a Tomas Nosek pass, just didn't connect, and all of a sudden, bam! I mean, and you thought, okay, uh oh, here we go. The beast is awake, right? The Avalanche mm-hmm. really are rolling downhill like an avalanche, right? With force. Swayman made a great save. Uh, I'm blanking. Who was it on? Um, was it on Land? Uh, I was going to uh, say Landeskog, right? I think it was Landeskog. Yeah. Yeah. And off the glove area, but a great save soon after that. And nothing else happened though. Colorado never got sustained offensive zone time. They never got the Bruins back on their heels to where we were sitting up there in the fifth floor studio suite saying, "Oh shit, here it comes." So kudos to the Bruins for that. I think they protected the middle well. They extend their lead about two minutes later, not even fully two minutes after uh, McKinnon scores his goal. David Pasternak with his second goal of the game, a howitzer of a shot. So we've two, we've seen two howitzers in the last two games. We saw the Ottawa goal clanging off the post and in under the crossbar. And then this goal, a second set faceoff play. The first one worked, didn't result in the goal, but then soon after this one again, an absolute thing of beauty. The Bruins set this up gorgeous off to the right side or left side if you're looking from the avalanche goalie, Darcy Kemper, Screes. A rotation play, point. Down the right point, down the left, uh, the right wall to the left wing, Taylor Hall, who had circled below the circle. He then finds Pasternak, who sifted high to open ice, middle of the the high slot, and a powerful one timer razor. As a goalie, you're watching the puck move all around. You think you must know that Pasternak's going to be able to get that. You're thinking that, right? That's just, but that's just how powerful his shot is. Yeah, you can't. You just can't get to it and that again that's why he's a 50 goal or 45 goal and other guys are six goal scorers because they just hit it harder they hit it differently you can't read it you can't get on top of it and and yes the goalies are all they know the pre-scout of all the face-off plays Kemper's an NHL goalie he saw the play before like you talked about so he knows exactly what they're trying to set up and and when he sees his his one winger go flying out at Carlo, he knows that something's going to open up, and it's going to be to David. And mm-hmm. you try and get set, you try and get to your spot, but there's no reacting there. You just you, you you need it to hit you. You need David to miss just a little bit, and if he doesn't, then you have no chance. 
So the Bruins are up 3-1 to one at that time. Jake DeBrusque scores a goal about a minute and a half, not even a minute and 10 seconds later. Uh, Lazar and McAvoy, the assist, both of them with nice plays. McAvoy keeps it at the right point. He almost gets on it. He's really on his heels, Razor. He's at his, the right point, and he has McKinnon, who if, if he misses it, is going to just blow by him. He somehow just <laughs> doesn't swat it. He just almost just gaps and pushes it, stays in. Lazar sees a wide open DeBrus mid low slot. DeBrus shot from just past, or just in front of the top of the ref's uh, goalie's crease, somehow gets through the five hole of Kemper. I said to you on the air too, I thought Darcy Kemper, I don't know, maybe. My my to my uneducated eye, I thought Kemper waited back a little bit. But at six foot six, at his size, I would think he comes out a half a stride into the top of his blue paint there. Well, and we didn't get to break. We didn't really talk about it. But even even if he's if he's two millimeters forward, that puck doesn't go in. It stays on the line. The D man wipes it away. Good right? point. Yeah. If if he's if he's literally four inches further up into his crease, that puck doesn't go in. That's how close it was to crossing the line. So. So yeah, he 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 should have been a little bit more aggressive, and and he he seemed to play a little bit conservative all evening when he could have taken a little bit more of advantage um, with his depth and size. But um, DeBrus snuck one in for two in a row. Him and David getting hot together. He and Dave, you're right, they're getting hot at the same time. So it's four one at the end of two. Charlie Coyle gets a nice goal uh, four minutes into the third period uh, on the power play, a power play that really worked hard, worked the puck around an awful lot, had some chances. Coyle uh, comes from the side, almost behind the net to the front and is able to bank it off the uh, the backside of the goaltender Kemper uh, intentionally there. So a heady play. Is Darcy Kemper good enough to, to lead this team to a Stanley Cup? Are we are, are, Have we seen enough? I mean, by the way, this is the second time the Bruins have played the Avalanche pretty damn well this year. I know they ended up losing. They gave up a lead, you know, and then they lost in overtime uh, back in January. But those are two pretty good games. They're one on one against them this year. And is Kemper good mm -hmm. enough? I guess that's yeah, my real question. Not many teams are going to be one on one against Colorado. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's more of a defensive issue than it is Darcy Kemper. I think Darcy Kemper is good enough, yes. I, I think he has, with the firepower that they have up front, I think he has enough big save ability. Uh -huh. he, he doesn't, he's not going to have to be perfect. He's going to have right. to make a, the right save at the right time. And listen, the reality is the guy hasn't lost since November 26th. He does not have a regulation loss for two Pretty months good. going into tonight's game. I, so yeah. he, he's making saves. He's making timely saves. And, and so, yes, I think he's good enough with what they have in front. It, it, it For me, it's a centerman, a penalty killer, and, and maybe is their defense. Can they, you know, hang on with Las Vegas or a Carolina or Tampa or whoever it is. Meanwhile, I, Vegas, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a Kemper issue. I think Kemper's because, as good as Robin Leonard. I think he's as good as Freddie Anderson. I think he's as good as Jack Campbell. I think he's as good as and then you have Bobrovsky, Vasilevsky in that next tier, I would say, of the, the real contenders that everyone's talking about. It's interesting. And I'm not really gonna go tangent here, but I'm still not buying Bobrovsky. We can talk about him another time. Yeah, when no, I know. Play Florida again. I'm still not. Yeah. I am not there. He, 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 he. I think I may feel more comfortable with a Darcy Kemper, believe it or not, than I do a Bobrovsky. When it's all yeah. said and done, the team of Florida now in front may be better than the team in in Colorado. Mm -hmm. That's another yeah. another uh, discussion for another time. You brought up faceoffs. So, let's cut oh. to the chase. Let's cut to yeah. the chase. Let's cut to the chase. What are the lines going to be? Seattle. Oh, all right, you want to go there? Okay, I had that down as a note, but okay, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll be... All right, the the reason that Razor's asking this, if you're wondering why is he, why is he you know making a good question come to life right now, in case, but you're all great hockey fans, Bruins fans, so you know this. But in case there's one of you that doesn't, Brad Marchand is coming back. His six game suspension is over when the Bruins play Thursday night in Seattle, and now you've got decision, a tough decision to make because. Craig Smith, albeit who hasn't scored in like, I don't even have in front of me, 15 games, maybe, or one goal in 600 games? Yeah, it feels like it for him, right? He scored the one goal against yeah. Dallas, the, the goal with a minute or whatever left. And uh, he hasn't scored, but hardly at all in the last month, month and a half. Um, but he's on the right side with Coyle and Frederick. They've looked good together. Bruce Cassie doesn't want to, to separate them. 
So you know that Marchand's going to play on the left, Bergeron in the middle. You know, I got to imagine that Halla goes back to the middle between uh, Hall and Pasternak. If anything, I will say I think I think Eric Halla has earned it. Has earned it. Meaning, even though he you know got shifted down to a, a left wing, etc. I, I feel like he did enough with that line with those guys. I'll give him that opportunity back again. All right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Your fourth line we know is Nosek, and we think it's on the right is or we know on the right is Lazar. Mm-hmm. Now, on the left, are you going to keep Jake DeBrusque there, or are you going to move Nick Felino there? You also have Anton Bleed that you could put there, or do you take Jake DeBrusque, who has a couple of goals in his last few games, and at times he has ridden the the roller coaster of really up, good and exciting. And really down, kind of almost non-existent, scary at times. So that roller coaster ride, can you can you say to him, hey, here you go. Running on the right side with the big boys. Go after it. Whatever happens, happens. If you score and we win, great for us. And you increase your trade value, great for you. Or do you just say, you know what, Jake? You needed a little kick in your backside. We put you on the fourth line. You were effective there. We're going to keep you there to keep that kind of effectiveness up. And now we got to figure out who the hell we put on the right side with Bergeron and Martian. I don't see it being Nick Foligno. I just, I just don't Mm. agree with that. No, no, no. Okay. No, no. So so we agree with that. that. Um, So who is it? Stunika. He's not a right Stunika, by the way, he's the, he's the one that's out at this point. in a month, in the, the most okay. So in theory, way. we think that a guy like Nick Felino goes to the fourth line, plays on the left side with Nosek and Lazar. So now that leaves either DeBrusque, you you right? Yeah. Well, you can't. Yeah, you can't put Felino up the line. Like he can't go. Pat. Like if you're going to keep Frederick Coyle together, if you're keeping mm-hmm. those three guys together, then you Felino can't jump any of those three guys. Yeah. So. I mean, here's something. Do you call up Zach Senishin from Providence who's doing well, a right winger, and you say, come on the trip with us, and you might get a chance. And, you know, here's another guy that requested a trade. He's played well from all indications. Down <laughs> Honestly, in Providence. That, that, that's the hang-up. That's the one hang-up. It, it, like, why are you asking for a trade when you're in the minors publicly? That's a good question. Fair because question. this is this is exactly what happens to players and around the entire league. Everybody's unhappy in the minors, folks. There's no, there's not one person. You see Jeremy Swayman's play the last four games. It's because he went to the minors and he saw how miserable it is and how much it sucks to ride buses <laughs> and how much you don't want to be there. Yeah. There's something to be said for that little three week stint for Jeremy Swayman and for any young player, especially if they haven't done it before, and for. Senish, this is exactly the situation, right? If he hadn't asked for a trade, it's so much easier for me to sit here, for you to sit here and politic for him and pine for him and say, why aren't we giving this guy a chance? But it's hard for me to say it because he asked for a trade. Like I, I wouldn't, if if I'm the GM and this kid did this, I'm out on him. Doesn't matter. And he missed his opportunity to play with Patrice Bergeron and Brad Marchand. Can you imagine? Okay. I agree with you. I'm trying to take the other side of it, though, too. Your team needs to keep winning games, and you mm-hmm. need to keep increasing the trade value of Zach Senishin. And if you show somebody that he can handle a uh, a couple of week run, so to speak, even a couple of games, good games on the right side with them, does that help you move him and maybe win some games? Yeah, and it could. And that's to... why I can't be, I wouldn't be able to be a GM or a CEO because I take these things personally and I don't even know the kid or anyone else. I just like have this thought in my head that I'm like, all right, I can't, I can't vouch for him. Yeah. But you're right. If you're running a team, you're running an organization, you have to overlook all these things and you have to do the right thing for that group at the time. And it really could be the it it should be the first round right winger that is playing great in the minors taking right. that stuff on. That's yeah. that's what we, it should be. 
so notice that we haven't brought up Oscar Steen's name. I think we realize that he he's probably not an up the lineup player either. He's a third, fourth liner. Nothing mm-hmm. wrong with that, but. We don't see him. I don't see him being the immediate answer. I I personally think if you're not going to call anybody up, which I'd be surprised if they didn't, just given the length of the trip they're going on and where they're going. I I think that they I think they moved to Brusco over to that right side, and you put Felino on the the left of the fourth line. I don't love Studnika coming out of the lineup. Uh, if if only because he's been better. Just to give you his numbers in the game against. Colorado. I played 12 minutes. He had a shot. He was two for two from the faceoff circle. He's been picking up. What does he have? A couple of assists the last few games. I mean, he hasn't. He's been better. He's he's been better. But if you're going to keep, I mean, you're not unless you put Nosek on the left side and you move Stanika to the center on the fourth line. Could could you do that? I don't think so. I don't. Huh? I mean, the, but it doesn't. It doesn't solve. It doesn't solve the real problem up top either. Because then that that means you're putting to like, then you're then you're taking Felino out of the lineup, which is saying okay. something. It feels like they're doing everything they can not. Well, to they do took that. Forbert out of the lineup. They finally took Forbert out of the lineup. So you know what? They could take Felino out too. They could. Yeah. They might. So maybe that's the hard decision that Bruce Cassidy's talking about. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens with the lineup. Next game again for the Bruins is Thursday night uh, in Seattle. I've got a couple of other things to run through, and we're going to get to them quickly as we get going more on this uh, morning brew with Jaffe and Razor. Uh, but I quickly want to just remind folks that our friends at Fazenda, Fazenda Coffee Roasters, uh, Boston Specialty Coffee Roaster, located right in Dedham, uh, is back with Morning Brew with Jaffe and Razor. We can't thank them enough. Razor, I got good news. Product is heading out this week for us, okay? We're uh, we're going to be Perfect. getting some good Perfect stuff. Everybody's going to be happy. I had my Fazenda. I had actually my Fazenda blend uh, this morning, a medium to dark type. I'm, I'm a dark roast type of guy, a strong coffee guy. Really like the Fazenda, nice and smooth. Um, here's the great thing about Fazenda. If you go to uh, fazendacoffee.com, give them 15 per, or get 15% off when you put in Morning Brew, the code at checkout, Morning Brew. Um and you can enjoy if any of the, I mean, there's like, it feels like 500 roasts. There aren't that many, but it's just a ton of great, unique roasts, very high end, great stuff. Just to give you, you know, and I, I asked my buddy Pete over at Fazenda Razor for some places. We know Davio's carries it. We know Whole Foods carries it, but he gave me a list of about 10, 12 other places. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll talk what about each one or one of them per show, just super quick, just to say where you can also find Fazenda. For instance, you can find them at Flower Bakeries, and those are all over Boston and Ooh. Cambridge. There's a bunch of them. And so they're serving Fazenda. My right? wife goes nuts for that place. I know. I got to tell you, they got great chocolate chip cookies there. They really do, but not top mm. shelf chocolate chip cookies. So our friends over at top no. shelf cookies, no. um, but they are, they are, listen, uh, they got a nice bakery over there. They also serve Fazenda Coffee over there. Go check out Fazenda, fazendacoffee.com. And uh, again, use code Morning Brew. All right, couple of other things. The play of Jeremy Swayman, buddy. The best part of his play, fill in the blank. The best part of Jeremy Swayman's play now the last couple of games is what? Control. Okay. How's that? Pretty good. Awesome. On the spot. Love it. Control. Right. Especially, especially today against Colorado. That can be a game where you get too nervous, too jacked up. Too movie, too much going on. He actually, I thought he dialed it back a little bit, even, uh-huh. um, which which was impressive. He he was able to stay a little bit more conservative, stayed a little deeper, didn't get going, didn't chase any of these good Colorado Avalanche players. So uh, controlled, excellent. Solid. He was very focused. Uh, I I just I you know he's in he's on a roll right now with what he's doing. <laughs> Uh, good for him. Now, does he get the next start in Seattle? I was wrong. I thought they would go to Olmark against Colorado. Shows you what the hell I know. Absolutely freaking nothing. We know that. It was just a feel thing. You've got to get him going. If you don't play Olmark in Seattle, he's been off for a while now. He hasn't, that would be a, that would be a long run for him. Is that, I mean, are we at the point now where it doesn't matter Razor that we're saying, look, Omar, you know, you play, he did play against the Islanders, but it's only one game that he's played in since February 10th. So if he doesn't play on Thursday, that's one game he's played since Feb 10. That's not a lot. 
No, it isn't. It isn't. And, but I think, I think you need to, I, I, I think you're still going to be able to get all mark in after this, this week's a little light again. And then you start getting the back to backs going and, and things will pick up. And, and I think if you're all mark and, or if you're telling all mark, you're still going to play a lot of games here. Mm-hmm. But I think at this point, you get to a point where you have to, you also have to run with the keep testing Swayman. And today was a test. I think you you can test them again with a road trip on the way out. On the way out, it's hard. Mm-hmm. That first game on the way out there is always difficult. All right, we'll test you here. And then and then you can go back to Allmark on Saturday. That that's 10 days break. And then Allmark's gonna play one of those other ones too. So you can technically still get Allmark into two games in the next five days without playing them on Thursday. So Mm -hmm. I I would, I would suggest that both guys are going to play two of the next four games and you can back it. You you could do it either way. I I, I would test Swayman on the way out. That's what I would do. All right. So you'd give him, you'd give him that call. By the way, the Bruins are leaving on Tuesday. No team practice on Tuesday. They're flying out Tuesday all the way across country to Seattle. They will get in. Hopefully we have, have even enough time just to get a little dinner, get to bed, and then they'll practice Wednesday to help get acclimated to the Western time zone, the Pacific time zone, and get themselves ready for the game uh, on Thursday. Um, one other thing we met, you mentioned face-off Bruins were dominant in the face-off circle. Patrice Berger on 74%. Holy shit, was that a big difference? That was great. I saw this on social media as I was just getting ready for our show. This is the last thing I want to say. Did you did, did you happen to see it or not? Uh, the the Nathan McKinnon uh, slash the of slash? a Did you see that in, after a neutral zone face? I, I didn't like I that did. he had got. And he's going to go after. I Tomas. didn't see it in a game. I didn't either. We didn't see it. And is he trying to slash Tomas Nosek? And yet he ends up getting the shin of the linesman. The linesman uh-huh. must not have thought it was that bad because he didn't call any, he didn't stop play when it happened. It was just interesting to see that. Um, I want to say kind of funny. I don't know. I thought McKinnon yeah. the other day, you showed we talked about his hit the other day against uh, Vegas, right? Um yeah. was it? Uh he should have been I don't know Patrick, how he didn't get Nolan anything Patrick. for that against against Nolan Patrick. No, how that was not get that was for that? so much worse than what Hall did to McKinnon. It was it was deliberate, it was Puck was nowhere near them. The, there wasn't a collision. It was it was intent. Uh, so yeah. Nate Dog plays with an edge. So there's no question about it. Well, he's going to have to remain in control. I think he's. I think they're watching him now, uh, just a little bit. All right, it's going to wrap up this morning. Mm-hmm. Brew with Jaffe and Razor. Good stuff, buddy. Bruins win five to one over the Colorado Avalanche. Um, feeling pretty good. Uh, about where they're at right now. When I say they, I'm, I'm, I'm saying where they're at, meaning the last couple, they found it, and a lot of people were, they found a decent game, and they they found a way to get by with a 3 2 and 1 record. Um, they still have two games in hand on Washington. They're just three points behind them for the, for the first wild card spot. Um, you know, I mean, they're five points behind Toronto, who's lost two, their last two. I mean, could they? Maybe we'll Charles, see. Thanks. Looking forward to watching Brad Marchand coming back on Thursday night. Very interested to see how the lines will be. We didn't mention Vakaninen. He was supposed to play. Doesn't, didn't feel well in pregame warm-up. Took himself, told the trainers, took himself off. So they had healthy uh, Connor Clifton come in, who, by the way, I thought pretty, played pretty damn well. I think it may have been the – he didn't prepare for the game, so to speak. He just said, you're playing, you know, and he came out and played well, I, I thought. Much better. So you did a good job. There's probably some scouts in the stands. All the pro scouts are out and about right now. Maybe they took a look at Connor Clifton instead of Euro Vakanina. And hey, maybe maybe we could use a Connor Clifton in our, you know, you never know. Maybe. Yeah. Um, all right, Razor and I'll be back with you. We're scheduled to do the next morning brew on Friday morning or midday. The game is very late. We do have a on, on uh, Thursday night, 10 o'clock game. We do have a, a half an hour post game show. Uh, and We're, that Facendo order better get to us by Thursday because it's going to be a long five, six, seven, eight days. Yes, of coming hockey. up. It's going to be it's going to be a bit of a shit show. But anyways, listen, we'll be talking to you sometime on Friday again. And we'll record the next morning brew with Jaffrey Razor. Everybody have a wonderful day. Enjoy this victory, please. It was a lot of fun. Have a couple of great days off. Keep listening. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you, Berkshire Bank. Thank you for Zenda Coffee. We love it. And we'll talk to you later. And everybody, as always, enjoy that coffee.